The process of fuzzing is decades old, but isn't well known outside of cybersecurity circles. That needs to change. Luckily, I'm here with someone that can help us do that. Dr. David Brumley, hey David, is a professor at Carnegie Mellon University and CEO of For All Secure. And he's also someone that built the fuzzing technology that won the DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge. And he's gonna explain what fuzzing is and explain how companies can use it to help improve both their security processes and software development cycles. So David, thanks for joining me and let's jump right to it. What is fuzzing? Well, as you said, fuzzing was uh, named about 25 years ago. The story is Professor Bart Miller and his graduate students were looking at the reliability of Unix, Microsoft, and Apple applications. And they noticed something kind of funny. When they gave these applications a random input, they could cause about a third of them to crash. Pretty big number, right? It was really like the proverbial like monkeys typing on a keyboard. Right. But instead of creating Shakespeare, they found serious security issues. Mm. That's worse, right? It's, yeah. wor it's much worse. <laughs> so let me explain how fuzzing works. And I'm going to use uh, an analogy here. So think of a program like a maze, right? And so we know when a programmer is developing code, they have different computations depending upon what the user gives them. So here, the program is the maze. And then we have, let's just pretend, a little robot up here. And an input to the program is gonna be directions for our robot through the maze. So for example, we can give the robot the directions, and I'm gonna write it up here. Down, left, down, right. And he's gonna take two rights, just meaning he's gonna go to the right twice. And then he's gonna go uh, down a bunch of times. So you can think about giving our little robot this input, and robot is gonna take that as directions, and he's gonna Take this path through the program. It's going to go down, left, down, first right, second right, then a bunch of downs. And when you look at this, we had a, a little bug here. They can verify that this is actually OK. There's no actual bug here. And this is what's happening when a developer writes a unit test. So what they're doing is they're coming up with an input, and they're making sure that it gets the right output. Now the problem is, if you think about this maze, we've only checked one path through this maze. And there's other potential lurking buzzes, bugs out there. So what fuzzing does is it really automates this idea of coming up with an input and running the program and seeing if we find a bug. So for example, if we think about just switching these directions a little bit, we have down, left, down. But instead of taking two rights, we only take one right and then go down and some more directions. The robot may take this particular path through the program down, right? Instead of going two, it's only going to go down one. Say so it comes over here, and we find that the program crashes. Mm. Now, what Bart originally found, of course, was providing random inputs. So it wasn't just structured like this. Random inputs could actually cause applications to crash pretty often. Now, we're on our third generation of fuzzing techniques. It's no longer monkeys typing on a keyboard. There's a lot more tech behind it. Where the idea, though, is still the same. We're going to automatically generate an input. We're going to see if the program crashes or not. And here's the cool thing. It can be completely automated. By making a computer do this, as opposed to the developer writing the unit test, you can go through thousands of these iterations in a single second. Let me contrast this with static analysis, because I know a lot of people think about static analysis and fuzzing, wonder what the difference is between them. So when you think about static analysis, what static analysis is doing is it's looking at the program. It never actually runs it, and it's saying, well, there may be a problem here, maybe a problem here, maybe it knows already this is okay, maybe there's a problem it thinks here, and so on and so forth. But it's never actually proved there's a problem. So it's looking for patterns it's in the code. It's looking just for patterns. And so if you actually look at this maze, right, you can say, well, static analysis flagged this, but there's no way our little robot can get over there. It's blocked. And when you think about static analysis, it can potentially find more bugs, but you have to staff someone manually reviewing it. What fuzzing is doing is it's incrementally exploring the program to come up with these, to find lots and lots of problems. For example, Google has a project where they're checking Google Chrome and many of the open source libraries Google finds, uh, uses. And they found 25,000 bugs completely automatically with zero false positives over the last three years. I also want to Throw security aside and say, how can this benefit the developer? 
Because security is not always a cost. It can actually benefit. We all know that the better we test a program, the more reliable it's going to be in the field. And we also know developers don't particularly like writing test cases. And so by using fuzzing to come up with different inputs that execute all these paths, they're really just test cases. And you can do that to do regression tests over time. So one of the benefits beyond security of fuzzing is you can use it to speed up your software development life cycle to produce more trustworthy and better quality code. And so how can companies get started using fuzzing as a technique, and what are some of the actual fuzzers that are out there? Let's talk about that. So I started off by saying this was invented or coined 25 years ago by Professor Bart Miller, and we're really on our third generation. So the original set of fuzzers were what we call black box fuzzers. And they would generate an input, maybe at random or with some algorithm, and they just run the program and see if it crashed or not. Just over and over and just over. Okay. over and over and over again. Now the problem with that is if you're just generating a random input, it may not take the robot anywhere. For example, you don't want to generate an input that has the robot going down and back up and back down and so on and so forth. So that was the first generation. Um, these techniques actually still work today, randomly generating, but not as well. The second generation are what we call protocol or grammar-based uh, grammar fuzzers. And what they do is you have someone manually generate a template for how to create those inputs. So in our example here, someone may write a template that says always you know, go down, um, and then go either down or right, go either uh, left or right next, go after that maybe down again or up again, and so on and so forth. And if you think about what this is doing, is it's constraining the set of things you're going to explore. So for example, if you write this protocol or grammar out, it may end up inadvertently only checking part of the program because mm -hmm. you haven't actually said it's possible to go over this far. So that's the second generation. Great products out there today. The third generation is what we call instrumentation-guided fuzzing. And what instrumentation-guided fuzzing does is it generates an input and it watches as the robot's executing the path. And it learns from that to come up with the next input. And so sometimes this is branded as AI fuzzing. I, I don't think of it as AI, but it is learning. The more it executes, it's learning about which paths it's already looked at and what are the new places out there. So it's a little bit of the best of both worlds, right? You have a constrained process, but you're not missing half of the potential vulnerabilities. I think so. And I think if you go look at modern development shops, the people like Google and Microsoft who have put tons of money into this, they've settled on instrumentation guided fuzzing for a reason. Well, David, thank you for explaining uh, what fuzzing is. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about fuzzing and fuzzers, check out Tech Republic. Now, if you've got a topic you'd like to see David and I cover in a future video or a question, leave a comment. And if you like this video, be sure to click the like button or subscribe.